Hi, I'm Lena Rao. Welcome to our Ask a VC show where we put VCs in the hot seat. I'm joined by Paul Lee, partner at LightBank. Thanks, Paul, for joining us. It's my pleasure. Um, I want to go into your bio just a little bit. Um, you're based in Chicago, which yep. is where our LightBank has its headquarters. Um, you joined the firm in February 2011. I will pat myself on the back on this one because I broke the, that news on TechCrunch. That's fine. Um, you've led the firm's investments in Babaco, Beachmint, Udemy, Elacart, Skyvu, Contently, among many others. Um, and then previous, prior to that, I, I want to highlight your you were you um, led Playboy, the venture group at Playboy Enterprises, and, and was working there, and also was a founding partner at Peacock Equity Fund, the the fund uh, between NBC and GE Capital. That's right. So lots of VC experience, uh, both you know within the company arms and also now um, at at and at a, at an actual firm. Um, I I want to go into. Uh, something that I think relates to you being outside of Silicon Valley. Uh -huh. And the question that I have is, uh, you wrote a guest post this past week on how to find the perfect co-founder. And that's, I know, something that a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with at the beginning um, of starting a company. How, how do you find someone that matches your skills, yeah. um, whether you're non-technical or technical, especially in an area outside of Silicon Valley, like Chicago or New York, where you don't have yeah. this, like, crazy network of, of startups um, and people and entrepreneurs who are sort of jumping from startup to startup to startup. Well, and I think that's happening, though. Like, particularly in Chicago and New York, you're seeing that ecosystem develop. And so you're starting to see the meetups becoming more populated. You're starting to see ad hoc kind of get-togethers amongst people in startups. But I think the big thing, and the thing I was writing about, was um, not being so secretive, like talking about what you're doing. And I think there's kind of this, like, polarizing attitude of... I'm working on something, but I'm going to keep it to myself because it's so stealth and it's so amazing. And I think as most investors would agree, it's all in the execution and the idea actually plays a very small part of it. And so, you know, being on social media, going to meetups, talking about what you're doing and like being very public about your skill set and what it is that you're looking for. I think it ends up like uh, we invested in um, Contently mm -hmm. uh, and it's content marketing. But like if you think about it, it effectively is quality content marketing because people can read about what you're doing and they can see if it fits with their skill set and what they believe in. And you'll start getting inbound kind of deal flow from that perspective. So to the extent that you're public, you're out there, you've, you're developing a body of work around what you're working on, what your skills are, and what you're looking for, I think that starts attracting quality people that are interested in what you're working on as well. Do you think um, that, you know, do you, do you necessarily have to look for someone? Like if you're a non-technical co-founder, yeah. do you have to look for a technical co-founder or vice versa? Yeah, I, I think, you know, you, I, I wouldn't necessarily put it in the, in the basis of technical versus non-technical. But clearly, from a strong management team perspective, you wanted a rounded skill set. So when we look for investment opportunities, we look at, you know, one through four um, do they have a rounded skill set? Do they complement each other? So from that perspective, if you're a non-technical founder, clearly you're going to want someone in a leadership role that can round that skill set out. Okay. Well, yeah. that's definitely good advice for anyone, you know, in business school or, sales, right. you know, in sales and marketing who who wants to maybe start something and is pitching LightBank. They're going to be evaluated based on the talent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I want to go to a reader question um, about pivots. And... Uh, this one was how to deal with the current stat following a pivot. Uh, you have a team of skilled employees, it's very useful, but when that change occurs, um, people's roles and skills change, of course. Right. So um, as the business model changes, how do you evaluate the, your staff based upon that and, and what's your advice? I mean, so first off, if your business is pivoting, the reality is it wasn't working. So whatever combination you had there, like probably should change, right? So. Uh, I think the other aspect of this is pivots typically happen very early in the life of a company because they're looking for a business model. And so from that perspective, um, I, for us, the philosophy is get athletes versus specialized like skills. And so if you can code in multiple languages, you have full stack on the business side. If you can market and you can do biz dev and you can do whatever, like versatility is the name of the game. So you know, in the context of an early stage company pivoting, the people around the table that are there should be versatile. They should feel very good and very open to completely changing their role. And if they're not, then unfortunately that's probably a fatality within the business and the company should kind of remove those people. 
And so, you know, some of that is, does that employee have a long-term future with the business? And if there's not an immediate role, then I would argue it's probably better for the employee to find another situation. Do you have any sort of anecdotes from any of your startups? Have you ever gone through a pivot with a startup and, and how has that worked as on the investor side? Yeah, I mean, how many, like, which businesses don't, right? Because <laughs> yeah. ultimately, I think, you know, as you think about an investment thesis, um, the thing that we look for ultimately um, is attractive market and then quality team. And then the business model is, you know, it's important because that's an entry point and that's a thesis, but you're constantly testing the different theses that are out there, right? And so to the extent that something isn't working, yeah, you want to fail quickly. You want to move on from it. And as long as you have the core quality team and you're still attacking that quality market that you found attractive, like, I think it's fantastic. Like, you know, uh, I think we have a quote somewhere within LightBank on the walls, and it's like, I have not yet failed. I have just found a thousand ways um, that are going to prevent me from succeeding. So, you know, we adhere to that. You know, we want you to fail fast. If it's not working, we want to move on to the next thing. Um, and, you know, we continue to believe in the market and the team. Um, I want to go to another reader question, which I think sure. is pretty interesting. Um, once a startup receives Series A funding, what's the best way for them to set salaries? So, yeah. I, you know, if I'm a 30-year-old entrepreneur with student loans, a family, a home, yeah. do I deserve a little bit more because my bills are higher? And would VCs get <clears throat> upset if you take a larger salary or not take a salary at all? Yeah, so I, I think, one, there's market data, and that's readily available. We're in 63 companies now, and we can tell you by round what the average salary by position is. So we have that market data available, but I think each situation is a little bit different. So typically the CEO or the founder um, is the largest equity holder in the company. So they should be thinking about their cash burn as you know something that allows me to raise as little money as possible. So to the extent that they're taking salary and they're actually giving up more equity, if you think about it, because they're gonna need to raise more capital to offset that increase. Right, right. So you know, we love that owner mentality, like, you know, the best CEOs we've seen typically take the bare minimum salary that they can get by uh, because they value the equity. They're thinking about it in terms of equity preservation. And I think the other they aspect wanna, is... They want to build a long-term company. They want to build a long-term that company, and if they're raising it at a certain valuation, they feel like, hey, you know, this valuation, I ultimately feel like our company is going to grow beyond that valuation, and so I don't want to take burden right now. I want to spend as little as possible, get the company to a much later stage, raise more money at that higher valuation, and then we can talk about if, you know, what salary raises make sense. What about older entrepreneurs? I mean, you probably get pitched by some really, yeah. really young folks, yeah. and then also some people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, though I don't think older entrepreneurs yeah. are necessarily 30, 40, and 50, but, yeah. you know, what, do, you, do you ever, you know, does that ever go into your consideration? I, you know, it's weird. Anecdotally, um, like, we've never done the analysis, but I have a gut feel because if I think about the, 40 or so startups I've invested in, I can almost draw a direct correlation between CEO salary and likelihood of success of the company. So the best companies we've seen generally, the CEO is very greedy about the equity and does things that indicate that. You know, the guys that uh, are leaving a $300,000 a year job and are willing to take a $50,000 pay cut, generally the risk tolerance for those guys um, is a little bit tough because they're not you know, really vested in the equity, right? So um, I, I would, it's probably a little controversial, but I, I think a salary uh, for a CEO uh, up to, say, a Series B should never really exceed 150000 to get into specific numbers, but frankly, lower the better, as um, long as they can get by. Well, good advice for any entrepreneurs out there. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the trends we're seeing in the VC world and you know, you're doing ton. I know you're looking at a lot of deals on a day-to-day yeah. -day basis. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about valuations being sky high. Are you still seeing that? You know, that was a big sort of trend last year, and some people are saying that it's gone down a little bit. But what's your? I think it's gone down a lot, actually. Yeah. And so, actually, the world bifurcates into Silicon Valley and non-Silicon Valley. And so, I, in Silicon Valley, I think there's been some softness, and we've seen valuations come down. Um, outside of Silicon Valley, I think the world has largely returned back to normal. We're seeing, you know, uh, for you venture investors out there, like just to give you a sense, average pre-money in Chicago is like $2 million, right? And these are companies that are somewhat far along. Right. So really attractive investment opportunities. And I think the softness in the market has helped um, from an early stage perspective. I think the big gap, frankly, is 
these really large Series A's now, right? And that's a, just a function of the fact that leading firms have gotten much bigger. So you're talking like 15, 20 million? Right. Or, okay. So you'll see these like, what historically you used to see three, $5 million Series A's. And now they're really like $10 million Series A's, right? Because I think the couple things are, are a factor there. Like in terms of online marketing, it's just gotten so sophisticated that you can ramp a company so quickly because you have the CAC LTV equation and you can, through Facebook, through uh, Pinterest now, there's a, a bunch of channels where you can accelerate and acquire customers quicker than ever possible. Right. And the other aspect, I think, is the funds have gotten larger. Of so course, the leading yeah. funds like Andreessen, Excel, that dip into the early stages, you know, if you have a billion and a half dollars under management, you're not really all that price sensitive, whether it's a 30 pre or a 40 pre. Right. You just want to own X percent of the company. So you're seeing those two factors combine, and then you're seeing this big gap between a seed stage company where the vast majority don't have that sort of momentum. And then you have the handful of companies that kind of catch on fire. And then you have a handful of firms vying for those valuations. Well, it should be interesting to see where they go. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Paul. I really appreciate you coming. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.